Thank you, participants. Uh, we're going to uh, start with our first panel shortly. Our discussant will return. Um, uh, we, uh, he'll, he'll be, uh, Mr. Peter Iverson will be um, talking about uh, the papers uh, and presentations that uh, we're giving uh, today. Uh, this first panel is about history and the history of the Navajo Nation power and the, and, um, um, the history of the tribal government and then also looking into the future possibilities. Um, so we kind of follow a chronology. Um, I'm participating on this panel, so it's, it's kind of odd that I'm introducing it, but uh, that's, that's the way things go. Um, just for people online, we have this being um, streamed on the internet right now um, through the Navajo um, Broadcasting Services. And for those of you who are online who have questions that you want to give to us, uh, any of the participants, or you have any commentary, uh, you can email, or you can, um, there's an event page on Facebook, and I'm going to send that link uh, shortly. Um, or if you have Twitter, it's uh, hashtag future, uh, and then NN in capital letters. You uh, submit your question, put that hashtag at the end, and, uh, and we'll try to include those in the questions and comments. So, um, so without further any, without any more saying, uh, Amber will give our first presentation, then I'll follow, and then Mr. Lee. Oh, yak eh. Yak eh. Oh, yeah. Oh. Kiaani nishle do bilagana basas chin, des chini desa che do bilagana desa dale. She Amber Crotty in Nishie. I live out in Sheep Springs um, over the hill, and I'm, I'm really glad and blessed to be here. Yeah, to the commissioners, to the office, to putting together such a rigorous, um, rigorous and, and, and thoughtful presentation on the future of Navajo governance. I feel like someone's pulling me here. That was Andrew telling me to move on. A uh, little bit about myself is uh, my family is from Sheep Springs, uh, New Mexico. We were, uh, we've gone uh, from Sheep Springs. My family was relocated to the Los Angeles area during the 1950s where we co-mingled with the McDonald's and the Banali's and the Begay's. And so in, uh, in, in route of Los Angeles, I got my degree at uh, UCLA. I did my undergraduate at, uh, in history and got my master's degree in American Indian Studies Law and Policy. I came back to the, to the nation as a, as a policy analyst with the NEP Policy Institute, so I'd like to recognize uh, Chief Justice Robert Yazzie back there for giving us the opportunity as young researchers to come back to the nation and to look at these critical issues to create that pathway that is desperately needed. Um, I now am working as um, a legislative district assistant for the Navajo Nation Council um, under Delegate Nelson Begay, who also believes that young Navajo researchers can um, create a pathway for uh, a future of Navajo governance that's um, the foundation um, that's planted in, in Navajo philosophy. So I, I appreciate all of the leaders for um, giving us that opportunity. This presentation is gonna explore the legal history of blood quantum requirements and how they directly affect traditional Diné customs. In the most abstract level of Diné knowledge, all persons living or whoever or who have ever lived in the Navajo world are constructed of the same fundamental elements and structures on paradigm and directionality, which basically means in a sunwise movement and the trajectory of growth. We know in the morning we go with our prayers and pray with our taradin to the east, and that's where we create our planning um, throughout the day. And we go throughout the day and then we um, use those prayers to guide us to to create um, the decisions and the actions that are needed. And when we come to the darkness and when we rest our mind into the Hogan, we know that we reflect in our sehasen to see how we have come about in those um, discussions and in those areas and how the next day when we go out with our prayers, we can move forward. In terms of blood quantum, blood quantum requirements originally stem from European societal values of pure Blood, um, bloodlines and colonial racial hierarchies. The notion of blood quantum as a standard of measurement of, Indian, of Indianness, or for us, Navajo-ness, emerged from, to the forefront during the census of tribal members during the initial phase of the Dawes' roles. The European concept of, pure, of blood purity 
became quite literal, literal during the 18th century and the bias of future legal claims to federal land um, allotment parcels. Blood quantum requirements in the native communities were intended to determine the ending point of federal trust obligations to native societies. During the early 20th century, native societies were in the midst of federal policies of, of assimilation and cultural genocide and termination. Current blood quantum requirements could possibly lead to the eradication of tribes as we know them today and will definitely in the long term relieve the federal government of their trust responsibility. So I'm kind of laying down a premise on why we use blood quantum, especially in Navajo Nation, um, when our conversations with leaders, with community leaders, even with clan leaders, we're, we're describing ourselves as full bloods, half breeds, quarter, and um, I heard the, uh, the other day, um, to a certain point, uh, if you're considered a fourth of a blood quantum or below, you're really not Navajo. And so this presentation or this discussion will kind of just go over a general overview of the history of blood quantum, how we can use our own clan histories to revert that practice and to um, lay down a strong foundation in Navajo teaching, and what we can do um, to to use the clan system in our laws and policies to kind of strengthen um, where we need to go next. Uh, I had the honor of working with Avery Denny at Zanet Policy Institute who emphasized the Navajo clan system is the foundation for our generations and kinship. Having a clan identity is about sharing a, pol a political identity. So in recent years, the Navajo Nation Tribal Council conducted debates regarding um, the lowering of blood quantum requirements. In April 2004, uh, dele former delegate Irvin Keyswood proposed legislation to decrease the Navajo blood uh, membership requirement from one-fourth to one-eighth. The legislation would alter the Navajo codes until, um, until the people, clan leaders, and um, community members come along and can establish, when we talk about Navajo identity or to identify who is a Navajo, to really look at that. So the council does have the ability to alter some of the codes. Um, sorry, I'm, I know I'm kind of skipping around here. We were giving a tight schedule and I, and I hope to honor that. So just to throw out a few statistics, according to the 2010 US Census, there was uh, 339,129 individuals who claim Nav Navajo identity. If you want to kind of compare and contrast that, uh, the Vital Statistics Office currently um, has enrolled 300,049 uh, 300, members. So there's roughly a, uh, just over 32,000 individuals out there who identify as Navajo but are not um, legally uh, enrolled as citizens of the Navajo Nation. So Leonard Benali, manager of Vital Records Office, stated that the census and enrollment numbers seldom match because the census counts deals with demographics. Uh, although the Navajo Nation has no real system to accurately account for the entire Navajo population. And this is problematic because if you come from the federal side or if you're working with the tribe in terms of um, working on grants for communities, we know that our community is um, is severely underserved, and it's underserved because of the numbers. The numbers are skewed, and uh, the numbers uh, really do not reflect the, the tremendous need that is out there on Navajo Nation and in these urban populations, such as um, if you travel, such as many of you do, because I've seen you at different um, organization conferences, you'll know that you'll find a Navajo anywhere you're at, whether you're in China, New York, um, in Alaska, and uh, it's just amazing where, where Navajos have now migrated and, and call home. And so we have to look at uh, some of these issues in terms of who we identify as Navajo and how that really affects our funding sources in terms of social services. Uh, going back now to the traditional relationships, Navajo values and identity comes from a traditional creation stories and the teaching of our ancestors. A.B. Denny explains the individual clan system involves the concept, the conception, the growth, the development of every Navajo. It's generally agreed among Navajos that changing women selected men and women to establish the four original clans and instructed each member, 
excuse me, uh, to marry outside of their respected clans. Members of the four original clan believe they come directly from changing women's flesh, giving these members of these clans a special pride and prestige. Personal heritage and identity comes from the, long, the lifelong influences and responsibilities from the descending clans. Outsiders or current political leaders should not underestimate the profound influence of clan systems in the Navajo world. And so to move along, um, I really wanted to talk about identity and where personal heritage come from. And so when a, uh, we know when a Navajo baby is born, they belong to the clan of the mother and she passes down her, her clan name to her children. Danette distinguished four types of what we consider blood that run through every individual system. One type of each um, blood of the, of the clan is which he or she is associated. Through this blood intermingling, each of the clans influences the development of the Navajo philosophies and principles. The mother's clan is responsible for the training of the child in the sahakis, the development of awareness. Up to the point of the father's responsibility, the father's clan develops nahat ah, referring to the actions based upon thought and carrying out of plans. The role of the maternal grandfather is to instruct their children in the proper pattern of life, the Navajo way of ina. A child acquires spirituality through the flow of substance from his paternal grandfather's clan, Sihasin. Your mother gives you your thinking. You, your father gives you the planning. Your maternal grandfather gives you the life to live and to stand in what you believe. And when your paternal grandfather teaches you how to pray, you have hope, you have songs. And this is the construction of the Navajo identity, not necessarily a, a measurement or a, a quantum of blood, but how the blood interacts within your body, how it um, informs your spirit, how it, how it gives you hope, how it gives you the songs and prayers to heal yourself. We know from the original four in, in hearing um, Navajos introduce themselves. We have, we have incorporated, we have adopted, we have, um, have brought in families from the different bands of Apache, all the way down to um, Mexican, to Nakai, and to the La Plata Mountains. And what this demonstrates is that Navajo, uh, Navajos are not a stagnant society. We're not a society where you can put us into a museum and say this is what the idea of an, a Navajo is, and that's the idea uh, of a Navajo citizen. We need to learn to embrace and go back to how we have ad adapted throughout the years. Uh, skipping back now to recent debates in, in, in the council in terms of lowering the blood quantum requirements. And uh, since I'm now <laughs> at the council, I, I had the, the, the privilege and kind of the kind of uh, I was in a weird kind of situation where I talked to former delegates who actually worked on this legislation who opposed it. And I talked with George Arthur from Northern, and we were talking about blood quantum requirements, and he told me, uh, you know, seriously, uh, Shadesia, uh, I think after, if you're half, you're not Navajo. And I told him, okay, okay, how am, I gonna, how am I gonna do this? I'm talking about blood quantum, I'm talking about decolonization. And so I told him, Shanai, if, if my child comes up to you, and she's Kia'ani Nishle, and you shake her hand, and you, and you introduce yourself, and you bring her in as your child, is she Navajo? He said, of course, of course I would, of course, she's my relation. I said, well, according to blood quantum, she's only an eighth. And that's because of um, paperwork loss. That's because we have um, San Carlos Apache mixed in. And he said, you know, I never thought of it that way. I never thought that our clan relations would somehow undo the citizenship requirements of the Navajo Nation. And that's what we're faced at right now. We're faced at a crust where what are we gonna do to the future of our kids who are now either in Phoenix and wanna return, and they're returning with in-laws that are, are not enrolled members? What do we then do with um, children who, who want to work in the international community? We have um, 
people going out to Geneva who are working in China. What do we then do? And so we need to really look at that um, issue and see how do we want to create the future uh, of the Navajo Nation. I know I kind of went off track, but uh, it was an interesting discussion because it was really all of the former delegates. So Woody Lee was there, uh, George Arthur Keyswood was there, and uh, David Tom came in on the discussion. And we talked about what was the issue, um, why did they, why at that time did Keyswood want to uh, to decrease blood quantum, even though I, uh, I I've already kind of talked about why I necessarily did not believe in blood quantum. He mentioned that through ICWA or through child adoptions, uh, Navajo children are being adopted by Navajo families who may or may not live off the reservation. And so when they when they go into these families, if they're if they're able to go to a Native family, then they might have an idea of who they are. Well, there's uh, Navajos who are out there who who have no connection. They may. They might know their birth mother came from a certain area, and so they're trying to create these connections. And I think when we have strict guidelines or strict regulations, we kind of um, we kind of uh, take away that person's identity. Okay, I'm time. So in in light of time, uh, I have a lengthy discussion. This was my thesis. We can go into like the scholarly debate and and how that kind of um, in the future how Navajo Nation would look like. But I really want to stress that blood quantum is a foreign concept that was used by um, European monarchs in terms of who um, will take over reign in certain areas, and that's how they ended up marrying cousin with cousin. So we know from Changing Woman, that's not the case for us. So. I implore you to critically look at blood quantum and the future of Navajo Nation citizenship requirements. Yeah. My name is Andrew Curley. I'm uh, also a student, um, aside from being on the commission. Um, I'm a graduate student in sociology at Cornell, and um, my research is on, um, on uh, coal mining and, and kind of mining attitudes towards, um, towards, towards that um, occupation. Uh, in light of uh, some of the environmental questions that we have facing us and, and those type of things. This research here is a, is a thought project. It's something that I did uh, working in uh, historical archives in um, at the, what's called the New Li Newberry Library in Chicago. And, um, and it's, it's actually addressing some of the work that I was doing uh, prior, uh, previously when I was um, working at the Diné Policy Institute with uh, Mr. Yazi and Amber and Moroni um, here. Uh, so, so this was kind of a... Uh, a, a project different from my own research that, that was trying to uh, address some of the questions that we have and, and had and continue to have there. Um, basically, uh, uh, the title of my, my, my um, presentation is called The Origin of Legibility, State Formation and State Resistance Among the Navajo People Between 1868 and 1937. Um, the reason why I, I choose this time period is because the, um, the archives I was looking through uh, we're restricted to this um, this time period. However, I think that some of the insights that I, I try to pull away from from the work that I do here, we can we can think about them and we can possibly uh, apply them to things that we see happening right now uh, across the Navajo political landscape. So to begin, we have to kind of rethink what we're thinking about when we say Navajo or Diné, and um, it's it's kind of a, a segue from. Um, from what Amber had just explained with, uh, with her, her excellent work on uh, Navajo blood quantum. Um, what I'm saying is the story of the Navajo as a tribe uh, is a story of Navajo legibility. This is a, this is a, a concept, it's a, it's a concept rooted in, uh, in theory that uh, I'll try to explain through uh, in a moment. And basically what it is is a process of making an indigenous group uh, in, here in the Southwest into a standardized and simplified ethnic group within the United States. It is also a story of uh, what some people call state formation or the creation of official governments and, and uh, authority and hierarchies within, within these governments. This is a shorthand for that is called state formation, uh, which has occurred over the, la the previous um, you know, 70, 80 years with the Navajo people. And it is sought to turn uh, uh, Diné into an accountable population subject to simplification and uh, sometimes manipulation. Uh, once existing on the periphery of an expanding empire, the people who would eventually be called Navajo and who referred to themselves collectively as Diné eventually became what's called uh, a federally recognized Indian tribe within U.S. law. 
and members of that um, population, of the U.S. population. This development was, it was not and continues not to be wholly successful. And what my paper examines is how Navajo people uh, uh, resisted and, uh, um, and continue to resist these efforts. Uh, specifically, I examine how the U.S. government created the new forms of political authority between the signing of the Treaty of 1868 and the establishment of the Navajo Nation tribal government at the end of the New Deal in the 1930s. I also examine resistance, or what's called resistance, to these new forms of governing authorities and demonstrate how the Navajo people undermine these attempts. I have two basic points in this presentation. The first is the U.S. government created the Navajo tribe Tribe is a specific term here, and it's accompanying uh, regime or uh, government or uh, what we are know familiar, what we know as the Naval Nation Council, uh, in order to make the Navajo people legible, or, or legible means to read or to be able to, to understand um, through perception what, what, what you see before you. And the second point that I'm making is that actually the Navajo people resisted and continue to resist this um, uh, imposition of, of new forms of political authority uh, because uh, te tentatively we can say because it interferes with their personal autonomy, such as identity, um, as Amber was uh, uh, explaining, and uh, threaten their s sense of livelihood that we've seen uh, uh, with uh, government regulation in the livestock reduction uh, during, uh, towards the end of the New Deal. So I'm gonna go through a couple uh, uh, points here in this Prezi PowerPoint presentation. Uh, let's see. So the people of as a tribe, what does legibility mean? Um, and where does it come from? Um, legibility, like I said, is an act of uh, simplification and uh, schematic classification. It's an action of taking complex things and making them simple. Um, in today's modern state, or uh, um, simplification is almost requisite uh, for carrying out uh, Action. You have to know who the people are in order to have, that's the whole point of the census, that's the whole point of having a Navajo tribal identity, that's the whole point of having tribal membership, chapter house membership. You have to know who people are before you can do anything with them. Uh, funds for education are allocated by numbers. Numbers are generated from uh, census that people take. So that's part of this whole process. Um, just for time, I'm gonna kind of skip over that. For, um, for the Navajo people, uh, this began, this process of, of uh, legibility began uh, um, with the signing of the Treaty of 1868 at Vasco Redondo. Um, in, in the context of U.S. westward expansion, treaties uh, were the principal mechanism that created tribes. Tribes were created from treaties, in other words. Treaties introduced tribes and turned this collective concept of Diné that Diné people articulate and understand among themselves into closed categories of people, attaching legal weight to these categories and cre creating boundaries around these ethnic identities, like what blood quantum does. But it also goes further than that. It, it, um, uh, the, the, the category of Navajo tribe of Indians, which is what we're referred to within the Treaty of 1868, has reservation boundaries attached to it. It has provisions from the federal government to everyone else attached to that. So all of that is defined in the Treaty of 1868. And it's, un and it's understood that, that those services are going to a people that's called the Navajo Tribe of Indians, um, regardless of what we think about that. <laughs> I thought it was my own. I, I'm the only one that found that humorous. <laughs> OK. Um, The important thing is that um, I, I, I went through all of this already. The important thing that I focus on with this Treaty of 1868 is, um, is actually the, the way it, it changed notions of leadership. So uh, in the beginning of this, pres of this conference, Rexley, was, uh, Rexley Jim was talking about um, um, clan leaders and submitting your authority to the clan leader. My mother's clan is uh, Biligana, so I don't know who that would be. Uh, Mitt Romney, possibly. <laughs> he seems to be the, the, white, the king of the white people. So um, <laughs> I guess that's not a, a, an appropriate joke, but I can say it because I'm half white, so <laughs> I'm allowed to do those things. 
Um, but basically what happened was uh, the treaty created new forms of leadership. Um, what, uh, when Barbancito and Manuelito went to the, um, to met with General Sherman at this point, they were given authority over uh, the whole concept called the Navajo Tribe of Indians. And, um, and, and there, it's, it's telling, um, actually what's recorded in this exchange, and if you don't mind, I'm gonna quote a long passage, um, but uh, what Sherman is alleged to have said is that we will now consider these 10 men, the headmen that signed the Treaty of 1868, your principal men, and we want them to select a chief the remaining to compose his council, for we cannot talk to the Navajos, all to, you know, all of the Navajos at once. Barbancito was unanimously elected chief. Now from this time out, you must do as Barbancito tells you. With him we will deal and do all for your good. When we leave here and you go to your own country, you must obey him or he will punish you. If he has not the power to do so, he will call on the soldiers and they will do it. So that's not to say Barbancito followed these orders or that um, he acted as a, as a surrogate for U.S. political authority, but all I'm saying is that, in fact, that's what the U.S. wanted him to do. The U.S. wanted Barbancito, Manuelito, and all of these other um, earlier headmen and leaders to, to serve as, um, as a surrogate authority for, for the U.S. government. And essentially, at this time, what, what the U.S. government was trying to do was prevent Navajo people from, from uh, interfering with the expansion of the, the railroad line that, that goes through Gallup, Flagstaff, and, and westward. Um, so, so this is the beginning of, the, of, uh, of what we call, uh, of, of the U.S.'s government's attempt to, to try to create chiefs um, and, uh, and the headman system. Wow, I'm way over time, sorry. So you kind of get the gist of that, <laughs> hopefully. If you don't, we, we, can go, we can talk about this later. The other thing that uh, the treaty established were boundaries, as I said. They're, they're, the Navajo tribal uh, reservation you know, has expanded since the time of 1868, but, but at the time of its signature, at the time when people uh, uh, sign, were assigned to it, they, um, they had a, a really uh, a kind of a rectangular reservation between here and up towards Sealy, um, and and that that was where the Navajo people were, were supposed that was where they were supposed to um, to live. Now, what we know from from the historical record and what we know from um, in just everyday experience is actually people resisted this. Um, and in this paper, uh, which I can provide to you, it goes into more detail. But there are both uh, uh, weak and strong forms of, of these types of resistance, and um, and. A few that I focus on are our um, our resistance to this uh, to the reservation boundaries by wandering off the reservation lines. Just because you create a boundary doesn't mean people are going to adhere to it. Uh, there's also disobedience to to political authority, um, not only from the Office of Indian Affairs at that time, but uh, or their agents, but also uh, selected headmen that the uh, the Office of Indian Affairs was choosing willfully to work with. Um, there's there's an argument that I'm trying to make a, a tentative one that witchcraft was actually a form of state resistance. And um, I, I, I found some really interesting uh, stories within the, the archive, uh, the papers of uh, a soil crop scientist from, from the New Deal era, Solon Kimball. Uh, is that his name? Is, is that the right papers? Um, but yeah, anyway, this, this was a, um, an interesting incident where, where uh, a lot of um, witchery was used in order to, um, to prevent uh, horse, horse regulation uh, during livestock reduction. Uh, so, um, I have in my paper a lot of um, quotes from early 19th century, I mean early 20th century, late 19th century um, uh, commentators uh, within the reservation saying that Navajo people, even though they're giving these reservation lines, are not adhering to them. They're living wherever they want to live. And that's part of the reason why um, the reservation has increased uh, four or five times since 1868. Uh, the, also, there was no, there was no, um, there was no surveying done of the land at that time. But this, this willful disregard of the reservation boundaries can be arguably said to be a way Navajo people resisted state authority. And uh, like I said, with uh, let me go to the witchcraft real quick. Um, well, actually, uh, no, I, I'll skip that because I have two minutes. It's really interesting, though. Um, let me tell you, you can talk to me about that later. 
You want to hear about it? Okay. Um, I'll talk to you separately. <laughs> My final thoughts are, I'll take this off. <laughs> I like it. It's, 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 it's interesting. Sorry, this is a, a, a I'm, I, I'm covering too much terrain, but my final thoughts are that these subtle forms of resistance that I'm trying to document here, uh, uh, the Navajo, um, was the, the point of it was to remain undocumented, to not be part of that legibility process for you not to know what people were doing. You know, legibility says that you have to live within the reservation lines, but if you, if you, uh, if you actually don't do that and you try to remain undetected, you're not only resisting that claim that you have to live within the reservation lines, but you're also not being recorded um, in that process. So, so what, I'm, what I'm saying is that these are subtle. We don't really detect it. We're, when we talk about resistance, we're, we're often talking about, um, we're often talking about um, you know, rebellions or, or, or people doing dramatic acts against uh, BIA um, officials. But, but my point here is to say that that um, in fact, in, in just kind of common ways, people resist this type of authority. Um, okay, I got 47 seconds, so I'm gonna read my last paragraph. Ultimately, many of the problems and forms of resistance against the government authority that has changed since the Treaty of 1868 over the lives and conduct of the Navajo people have not gone away. So this is kind of what the point of my whole presentation is. Not only is the origin of this legibility question uh, a question for historical research, but it is also a question about kind of the root, what I, what I phrase here as the root of a pandemic malaise among Navajo people within the Navajo Nation government. I might reword that differently today. I re wrote this two years ago. Uh, but it's basically to say people are dissatisfied with the tribal government. There's a lot of angst against it. And, uh, and part of the reason for this is this question of it not being done in a legitimate way and, and being done uh, in a way that was, was designed to be manipulative. Um, so understanding these forms of resistance, these subtleties uh, in their historic forms, like I explained in this paper, uh, allows us to understand it in contemporary manifestations. When people vote to reduce council, what are they really saying? Are, are they concerned about council numbers or are they concerned about other things? Are there other issues at work here? Um, the same could be said about any number of, of recent political events that we've witnessed. So, that's it. Thank you very much. I'm a few seconds over time, but um, thanks for hearing me out. Kiani Nishli, Klaus Chi, Bashis Chi, Ashi Dutch Trade, O, a top of Hedda Shanala, Lloyd Lee and Shia, Beadil Dasanel de Nesha. Good morning. Um, my name is uh, Lloyd Lee. I am an assistant professor at the University of New Mexico in the Native American Studies Department. What I want to share with you is a article that I wrote quite a few years ago uh, that was published by the Wachashasa Review, which is an academic journal. Um, it's uh, published through the University of Minnesota Press. Uh, the editor of that journal is uh, James Writingen, who's a well-known uh, Pawnee scholar who does a lot of work with um, NAGPRA and repatriation. He asked me uh, when I was, uh, got my first uh, position at Arizona State University to do a special journal on Navajo studies. And so um, I was able to do that and it came out in uh, 2007. And so my article that I wrote was part of that journal. And um, some of the things that I say in there are uh, changed a little bit, but I wanted to provide some historical context to what, how Navajo government is today. And uh, so I'm gonna go through that pretty quickly. Um, but I also wanna share some of my uh, thoughts on some of the areas that we need to work on in terms of really decolonizing Navajo governance and some of the actions that we need to do uh, to kind of move in that direction, okay? Um, so the context first. So when we look at the, the Navajo political system or, or the living system, if, we, if uh, you want to use that term and that phrase, um, scholars and historians call that system sort of a natural community system. Um, it really is a description of a way of life that shows the flexibility of our living system. So uh, we had a structure in place, we had a governing system in place that reflected 
uh, our extended family networks, our clans, and in terms of how our leadership protocols and systems were set up, uh, which is vastly different than Western society, which is vastly different than a lot of other living systems around the world. So in terms of our leadership structure, um, we're very similar to a lot of indigenous communities uh, in the Americas. Uh, our, our structure and our leadership was based on our interactions with life. So for instance, um, we had a peace uh, leadership structure and we had a war leadership structure. Now, I think those are Western terminologies to kind of get us to think about leadership in terms of these two systems. Uh, but I don't think they really show the, the complexity of our leadership structure in place. But it, nonetheless, it gives you sort of a basic general idea about how leadership was structured. Okay? Uh, in terms of our governance, uh, one of the primary methods of governance in, in our communities was the, 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 the notion of, the, uh, of Natani. Um, now, individuals who were seen in this fashion were very limited. There weren't too many individuals that were seen as Natani. Um, but nonetheless, there were certain individuals that were. Um, and one of the primary modes of understanding that was through the understanding of their relationship that they had to the stories, through our cultural teachings, through our prayers and our songs, our ceremonies, our protocols. Um, along with that governance system, uh, in terms of that leadership, we had a system that produced a gathering. It was a spiritual gathering of individuals, of families, of clans that came together in different regions. And these different regional spiritual gatherings were a discussion, but they were also very ceremonial. And in, in many cases, these uh, spiritual gatherings took um, seasons. Uh, they would start in the fall and they would end in, uh, as spring came about because then they would disperse, um, go to um, their original homelands and plant and began to live and began to hunt. Um, because the spring was coming, the summer was coming, uh, things were coming back to life. Uh, so you have examples and stories of that type of regional gathering. Now, these gatherings were, uh, decisions that were made in these gatherings were of the families that were involved. They had nothing to do with other families that were in other places, in other regions of, of, uh, of our homeland. And so, on occasion, there would be um, messengers that would be sent to these types of gatherings from different regions to talk about situations that were occurring in those regions. And so that would happen. Um, I think those were, were uh, necessarily, not necessarily uh, all the time, but they would be there on occasion. Uh, so when we have, when we look at that political system, and then we have the, the traumatic experiences that come apart, that system is, is shocked. That system is disheveled in a lot of ways. And so there were two, uh, two ways that this was done. One was the um, American colonization. And in particular, our, our history and our experiences uh, with the Long Walk, uh, where you have many families who are taken to Fort Sumner. And you have families who hide and go as far as, as um, Colorado River and up uh, past uh, Navajo Mountain. So you have all this traumatic and shocking experience taking place at that time. So this political system is part of that shock and part of that trauma. Uh, the other aspect of that is the establishment of reservation. Um, Andrew talked about the establishment of the treaty and then families being brought in. Well, because of those families being brought in, you have trying a way to get back to a way of life that they knew. At the same time, though, there was a system, a Western system that was in place to monitor that, okay? And so, at the same time, our culture and our language was revitalized at this time. Um, our political system, though, had to shift because of the Western system that was in place. Um, 
federal agents, reservation agents, um, the establishment of a tribal police force as a way to monitor that. Um, so this is all impacting and changing the way that uh, our ancestors saw our political system. Now, the extended family network, the uh, clan systems, those were still very much intact and very much revitalized to maintain that. At the same time, though, there is that uh, point of dealing with adaptation and assimilation and acculturation uh, with a Western system that's being implemented. Uh, we really see a huge push in that in the early part of the 20th century. And two systems that I want to mention in regards to that. One is this establishment of the Business Council in the early 1920s. And then the other is also during the 1920s with the Chapter House system. So the Business Council gets established because the United States government, oil companies, needed a way to authorize them to come into Navajo land to extract the oil uh, in the northern part of the reservation. And so they needed that system in place to, to, to give them the, the legal realm to do that, okay? So that influence is, okay, who's going to be chosen as the leaders that are gonna be part of this council? Um, and of course, um, these are individuals that are seen as leaders in different regions and communities of the reservation. Um, but at the same time, they are not given any power to determine any type of agenda in the, those first few years. They basically are just brought together to say, okay, we want you to approve this uh, establishment, extraction of oil, that's it. And that's how they came together. So you have that as an example of that system being influenced and thrust upon Navajo communities. The other is the chapter house system. Uh, that gets established in the 1920s as well. This is a system that's designed by the federal government to simplify their interactions with Navajo peoples and to provide the services that were needed. Okay, so this is not necessarily a system that, that our, our, our communities and peoples created. It was a system designed by the federal agents to make sure that they had to simplify how they could get these services. In now, a lot of that chapter house system was created based on our natural communities where there were large extended family networks of people living in those regions. So they recognized that. They didn't necessarily create a, a chapter house where uh, no one lived. Um, it was done, but it was none, nonetheless a system designed to create a more simplified bureaucratic system for the United States. Uh, some other things I wanted to mention in the 20th century as it relates to Navajo governance. In 1936, there's a tribal constitution assembly that's put together. Uh, there's a constitution that's created, uh, but that constitution never gets approved. Um, and there's a lot of stipulations why that, that happened. Some of it based on the U.S. government finding certain things they didn't find acceptable. And there were some of the things that... Uh, the people that were brought together in that assembly didn't necessarily agree with in terms of what was stated in the Constitution. So, uh, so that Constitution never gets uh, approved by the Secretary of Interior. But nonetheless, the Secretary of Interior um, says that since you have an assembly here, why don't that assembly become a new tribal council? And um, we'll issue a set of bylaws, and the Secretary of Interior establishes those set of bylaws. Now, of course, those set of bylaws later would become codified uh, as a tribal code in 1962, and which is now what we call the Navajo Nation Code today. Uh, now, there were attempts in the 50s and 60s to uh, create a constitution again. Those were unsuccessful. One of the main stumbling or challenges to that was the oversight by the Secretary of the Interior. Um, but one of the things that comes about in those discussions in the Constitution in the 50s was the enrollment re requirements that Amber mentioned that were established in 1953. And so, uh, and those enrollment, it's very interesting kind of if you want to look at that history of how that came about um, and sort of the discussion that took place with that. Um, and then a, a year later, two years later, there is the mechanism that's put into place to start 
identifying who is Navajo, what's their blood quantum, census numbers, how that becomes attached, and so forth in the 50s. Um, in the 70s, uh, the executive portion of the council, the chairman, uh, builds more power, and that, and that has to do with um, some of uh, McDonald's vision in terms of what he sees as the Navajo Nation as, we, as the, as the um, 100th anniversary of the return from the Long Walk takes place in 1968, and sort of trying to, to really uh, build uh, an institution that really reflects uh, this notion of Navajo-ness. Uh, and then in the 80s, we see a, a real effort to increase uh, the court system, to provide more stability, more influence in that. And so that we have the creation of the Navajo Supreme Court. We have the reorganization of the court system itself. Um, and then, of course, uh, in 1989, we have the Title II amendments, uh, which really kind of solidifies this idea of a three-branch system. And then, of course, in 1998 is the Local Governance Act, which was designed to provide more local control to, to chapter communities. Uh, so, in terms of that context, we see movements and we see changes to our, our political system. Um, and I think what we're having our discussion now and what continues to happen in terms of just the community people talking about this is that these changes need to continue to happen. Um, in terms of pro to create an efficient, trustworthy, and reliable institution. And I think that's what we see with just the community discussion. Some of the things that, that I would like for you to think about uh, in terms of that is that when we talk about future Navajo governance, I think this, the paradigm of decolonization has to be a foundation of that. Um, because there are numerous indigenous peoples talking about it, writing about it, theorizing about it, and a lot of their ideas are very, very much in tune with their own cultural paradigms, with their own cultural ways and their own uh, language. And that's, that's, those are the things that, um, as, as Diné peoples, we need to, to, to make sure that that takes place. Um, and then the other thing is that all sectors of the Navajo population should be involved in this process. This shouldn't be just regulated to government officials or um, people who work in the government, but every sector of the Navajo population. These include the children, these include uh, adolescents and teenagers, these include elders, these include individuals that don't live on the reservation no more, that live in Phoenix and Albuquerque, Los Angeles, uh, or around the world. Uh, areas to focus on. Okay, real quick here. Um, we need to change the way that we think of the Navajo Nation and what it means to have self-determination. We're very much in tune with this Western notion that sovereignty and self-determination are the same thing, when in fact they're not. Um, we have to have a demand for a structural change to our current government system. Um, that reflects a lot of things that, has already, that have already been said in terms of this our Diné philosophy, our Diné way of thought. Uh, we have to develop an economic system reflecting those principles. Right now, we have an economic system that's very much along the lines of capitalism, and that has completely different worldviews and perspectives than, than our own principles. Uh, language revitalization is important. Uh, we need to make sure that we maintain and revitalize our language. Um, and then we need to get rid of this notion of a divide and rule concept that we have very much adopted from, uh, from other peoples. And we use that as a way to kind of corner our own way of making or creating some type of power within our own systems when, when it really doesn't do anything uh, for that. Um, and then the last uh, slide I have is sort of actions. How do we do this on a practical level? Um, well, first, uh, pe our peoples need to know and understand the fundamental laws, um, not in the sense of how they apply to the council or the political system, but how it really applies to our, li our living system, our way of life. Because the council, while they've done a good job of codifying it and making people aware of it, it really applies to our own way of life, our own stories, our own teachings, and our language. Uh, we need to redefine the role of Navajo government um, we also need to be mindful of historical and traditional notions of governance. 
Um, I think uh, Vice President Jim talked about that in terms uh, of the stories regarding women as leaders. Um, those are things that we, you know, if you look at some of the, the history and experiences, things that we see in terms of trying to push ourselves in a way that is seen in Western society on a different level. Uh, allow creativity, our work openly, so that all peoples know exactly what is taking place. Um, this can happen in just in a closed session. Um, allow opposition and convince them rebuilding Navajo governance is beneficial. Uh, we are human beings. Opposition will take place. And opposition needs to be involved in this process. Um, and to have patience and to listen to each other. Uh, sometimes we just sort of say things and we just goes right over our head and kind of focus on our own thoughts. I think the creativity and the discussion uh, creates that listening. Um, well, I've run out of time, so thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Lee. Um, to discuss these papers is um, noted historian, uh, Professor Emeritus at uh, Arizona State University, Peter Iverson. Peter Iverson, um, as you probably are aware, wrote the um, influential and well-used book, at least we use it a lot at the Diné Policy Institute, and I continue to use it in my own work, Diné, A History of the Navajo People. I think that's the right subtitle. Thank you, Mr. Iverson. Happy to be here. I'm sorry I have to speak into a mic like this, but I'll try to speak up and I hope you can hear me. Um, I want to say briefly that, that the three papers that you've just heard are, of course, parts of larger works in progress. And it's not that the uh, conference organizers uh, really wanted to have these papers be so short, but here we are. And I want to encourage you to talk with them. And I think one of the most important things about these gatherings is the opportunity to see work in progress, see recently published works, and to find a way to learn from it. Um, a recent PhD from Arizona State University, where I taught, and Sita Banali has finished a very interesting dissertation um, about Navajo government and, uh, and Navajo governance. And I'm passing that book around. So if you can, any of you are interested in this, um, I know people like if Larry Emerson hasn't seen this, it means it just isn't getting very good circulation and it ought to do better. So I'm trying to pass this around and try to talk to you about a few things. But in terms of the issue of blood quantum, in terms of the issue of, um, of Navajo development, especially in the late 19th and early 20th century, and in regard to a number of points made by Lloyd, we're really lucky to have these people working in the area of Navajo studies, American Indian studies. When I first came to teach at the Navajo College, Navajo Community College, as it was known then, it was a matter of taking a last minute invitation. Somebody from NCC called me up, said, we're looking for someone young and foolish enough to come at the last minute. I said, I'm on my way. Don't give this job to anybody else. I rented the smallest, oldest, and ugliest U-Haul truck in America and drove it from Madison, Wisconsin to Many Farms, Arizona. That was 43 years ago. And it was the luckiest decision and the smartest decision in many ways that I ever made. So I want to thank my many teachers from Navajo country over the years. I want to thank you for all that you've given to me. I want to thank you for a great many generous friendships. And I think this is just, I'm so happy to be here this morning. It's probably my last formal academic exercise in front of an audience. And I appreciate all of you being here too. One of the things that we need to think about in regard to this topic is simply the matter of history. I admit it, I am a card carrying historian I appreciate, I think, the importance of stories and the significance of memory. Today, it's really clear to me there are a number of things relating to uh, Navajo history 
that relate to the power of memory. You talk to people whose family went on the long walk or went through other ordeals. And these stories, as Lucy Tapahanso and many others have reminded us, are crucial to families and to continuation. So when we look to history, we're really not looking to some kind of old-fashioned history, the kind of history which many of you grew up with, which said history is something that happens to people. History is rather something that Navajos and others make. It's also a process through which we witness the creation of tradition, the prominence of place, the richness of language, and the employment of imagination. That's history. Anytime someone says to me, history is boring, I just, I'm really appalled by that. But it's the same, these are often the same people who say baseball is boring. And I say, well, you have, to, you have to know the rules, and you have to go ahead and make it interesting. One of the things that is so impressive to me about Navajo history is the ability of the people to make something last, to make something go on. And this, in turn, is reflected in the people themselves. Some years ago, I was working at the Newberry Library, Andrew mentioned it, um, in Chicago, and there was this young guy, this young poet, who was there for a little while. You may remember his name. His name was Rex Lee Jim. And he was going for a job interview at Indiana University. They were trying to hire him. And I talked to him for a little while, and I said, well, how was Bloomington? And he said, Bloomington was okay, but there weren't any mesas. He said, I don't want to live in a place like that. So here's this guy who went to Princeton, went to Bloomington, and, and went back to Rock Point. And Navajo history is full of examples like that. One of the things that historians are trying to do to try to bring in these stories is to think about how, um, how, Navajos, how Navajo people have grown and adapted. We know these stories. We know these accounts. But we ought to remind ourselves once in a while. What about you know, the way history used to be taught? It was Spain shows up, and essentially everybody dies. Everybody, there's nothing good to be said about the Spanish occupation. Well, in many ways, there isn't a lot good to say about it, but at the same time, what you're looking at here is a matter of people responding to it and taking things from it, including livestock, including weaving, and other things. And when you look to that story, when you look to those events, then you realize that this is part of a larger process, and it's something that really is crucial to look at. Andrew mentioned the period from the 1870s, essentially, up into the early 20th century. This is something that has been woefully generally neglected by historians. We have the Treaty of 1868, and all of a sudden, the next, in the next breath, we have livestock production. Well, that isn't really how it worked, of course. So we need to look at that time period, and we need to think about things. We need to echo Dave Warren's saying years ago that something happened is more important than when it happened. And I think at the same time, we have to give greater attention and credit to all the Navajo people who went to Navajo Mountain, all the people who went to Black Mesa, all the people who didn't go on the long walk, or long walks, I guess we should really call them. And that that's part of that story. And that made a huge difference, of course, in when uh, Chester Allen Arthur decided to divide up some of that country. When we think about those people, we think about that courage, we think about that imagination, we have to think about leadership. I think ultimately that's what I want to focus on for just a few minutes here. When you saw the Navajo Times yesterday, uh, you might have noticed a letter to the editor complaining about leadership. Uh, the week before, you undoubtedly saw another letter complaining about leadership or how this guy wasn't getting the job done. If I were president of the Navajo Nation, I'd be like the current one. I'd want to get in that boat and go out to Wheatfields Lake and not come back for a while. But this is an old story in Navajo country. This is an old problem. 
General Allotment Act, for example, in 1887, the Dawes Act. How come the Navajos weren't affected by it as much as many other tribes? Well, one of the reasons why they were not as affected by it as many other tribes is because Chi Dodge knew what was coming. And he said, he wrote a letter to the Secretary of the Interior in 1914 saying, don't do it. Don't do it, it'll ruin our lives. Navos have had leaders through the years who stood up and were counted and made a difference. And he is one of them. At the same time, we haven't paid enough attention to many of these people. Now, Annie Wanika, we've spent a lot of time paying attention to, and we should. Peterson Zah and many others describe her as one of their heroes, and we can understand that. But what about Tom Dodge? If you would ask the average high school student in Navajo country today, I suspect he or she would not have the faintest idea who this person was, even though he was arguably not only the first lawyer for the tribe, but also he represented the tribe at a very crucial time. But we don't know very much about him, and we don't know really very much about a lot of other people of that time and afterwards. We need to know more about them. We need to know more about leadership in regard to Sam Akia and Paul Jones and a number of other leaders of the past. What about Raymond Nakai? Certainly a major figure, and yet we really have very little in print about him. Maybe a few biographical details, but not really any analysis of policy. Now, when we look to those things, when we look to those issues, and see to Benali's dissertation, I do think it's especially important. Partly because she's one of the few people to ever get a PhD in history, who also is fluent in Navajo. But also because she wrote about something that really mattered. She wrote about Pinyon, she wrote about leadership there. When we think about leadership in Navajo country, we so often focus it solely in Window Rock, and we don't pay enough attention to leadership in a variety of other communities. And so I think that is just, you know, that's crucial. And that made a difference in terms of how people talked with her and who was willing to talk with her. She had some great conversations, I know, and they're part of the dissertation, about, the, um, about Pinyon and its current leadership and its recent past. Clifford Beck Sr., John Rockbridge, and other people came out of, came out of that area. In addition, we need to know more, I think, and these papers speak to this in one way or another, about the people against whom Tom Dodge and others worked. In other words, if part of who you are is who you are not, then we need to think about that opposition and how that affected things. And we need to think about people like John Collier, even though that's not a very happy topic. I've always liked Ben Morris, an oral history project, and they talked to me, he says, you know, John Collier was not a very handsome white man. He said he was kind of skinny and he looked, he was wearing all black and he looked kind of like a crow. Well, that's one image at least, and it's not a very positive image, but at least it's an image. You think about people like this and, we, and the tremendous power they had. Why was Thomas Dodge willing to talk to him at all? Why did he call Collier, of all things, a plumed knight? at the time when he was talking to the council in 1933. It was partly because Collier had very little contact, relatively speaking, with Navajos up to that time. And he'd been a better commissioner of Indian, he promised to be a much better commissioner of Indian Affairs than Cato Sells and some others who recently been there. Okay, so, but if you look to Collier's talk to the, the Navajos at that time, you just want to shake your head because it's all there. All the arrogance and all the romanticism and all the rest of it is right there. He gives one sentence which goes on and on. It goes on. It has 11 commas. Well, I would say to all of you, don't trust anyone who writes a sentence that has 11 commas. When we think about these, when we think about this history, when we think about these stories, when we think about this evidence, there's a lot of it that literally no one has looked at. When I was working on the Diné book about 10 years ago and also put together some documents, and I'm going through the pages, you know, and you get tired, and you're wondering if the money is still good in the parking meter and all the rest of it, 
and you keep going, and then all of a sudden you see this amazing letter to someone like Cy Fry or someone else, and you just can't believe it. Did they really say that? So even though many of you may not think of this history as being exciting, I can assure you that it is, and it's crucial right now, I think, because we're going through this big transition, maybe, maybe not lastingly, but maybe linguistically and so forth and so on. And we need to have that kind of contact. We need to have those kinds of direct experiences. A number of years ago, I was invited to give a talk at Lloyd's uh, alma mater at Dartmouth. I was real flattered. I was teaching at the University of Wyoming, and I was eager to get out of Laramie, Wyoming. It's nine months long winter. And, and I said, sure, I'll talk a little about the McDonald administration. And my friend at Dartmouth said, fine. We're also inviting McDonald out. He's going to give the keynote address, and he's also going to comment on your presentation. <laughs> I said, historians aren't supposed to be put in that kind of a situation. He said, well, you just agreed to come, so I did. Um, and when we think about those kinds of adventures, when we think about the kinds of opportunities that are there, I think there is work to do, but there's also tremendously exciting work to be done and is being done. Finally, let me just say this very quickly, that there are other issues relating to this that I think are so important for us to get into. One of them, obviously, is urbanization. Not in addition to relocation and so forth, so forth, but what about urbanization in Shiprock? What about urbanization in, of all, uh, in, of all places, Nazlini? What about places that used to be centered in livestock and now are not? What about people who used to speak the language and now are not? What does that tell us about the kind of um, cities, communities, chapters that are being created now. Let me close with a, some words from Vine Deloria, Jr., one of my heroes, who said that historians must bring historical consciousness to the whole Indian story. He said, to bring full light in order to regain the values which we cherish and admire from the heroic past. We can do no less, he said, for this generation and for the generation coming after us than to give them a sense of, of what can only come to people who really have a history. Thank you.